Chapter 4 I looked at him, or at least felt as though I looked at him, because it is a most difficult experience that a man can undergo to have his head in one place and his sight many feet away, coming from a distant place. Anyway, I looked at him and I thought, what marvel can this be? The man says that he can show me cities on the other side of the world, yet he cannot show me my own country. So I said to him, Sir, will you put something in front of the sight box so that I may judge of this matter of focus for myself? He nodded, his head in instant agreement, and cast round for a moment as though wondering what to do. Then he took from the bottom of my table a translucent sheet of something upon which there were very strange markings, markings such as I had never seen before. Obviously it was meant to be writing, but he turned over what appeared to be a few sheets, and then he came to something which apparently satisfied him immensely, because he gave a pleased smile. He held the thing behind his back as he approached my sight box. Well, now, my friend, he exclaimed, let us see what we can do to convince you. He slid something in front of my sight box. Very close it was, and to my astonishment, all I could see were blurs. Nothing was clear. There was a difference. Part was a white blur, part was a black blur. But it meant nothing to me, nothing at all. He smiled at my expression. I could not see him smile, but I could hear him smile. When one is blind, one has different senses. I could hear his face and muscles creak. And as he had smiled often before, I knew that those creaks meant that he was smiling now. Ah, he said, getting home to you at last, am I? Now watch carefully. Tell me when you can see what this is. Very slowly he pulled the obscuring sheet backwards. Gradually it came clear to me. And I saw with considerable astonishment that it was a picture of me. I do not profess to know how this picture was produced but it actually showed me lying on the table looking at the men who were carrying in the black box. My jaw dropped open in profound amazement. I must have looked like a real country yokel. Certainly I felt one. I felt the heat rising and my cheeks were burning with embarrassment. There I was, done up with all those things sticking out of me. There I was watching the four men maneuver that box and the look of astonishment on my face in the picture really did get home to me. All right, said my captor. Obviously you get the point. To drive it home, let us go through it again. Slowly he held the picture so that I could see it, and moved it closer to the eye box. Slowly it got unclear, until I could see a whitish-blackish blur, and nothing more. He whipped it away, and then I could see the rest of the room again. He stood back a few paces and said, You cannot read this, of course, but look. Here are printed words. You can see them clearly. I can see them clearly, sir, I responded. I can see them very clearly indeed. So then he brought the thing closer to my eye box, and again there was that blurring of vision. Now, he said, you will appreciate our problem. We have a machine or device, call it what you will, which is a very much greater counterpart of this eye box we are using on you, but the principle would be utterly beyond you. It is such, however, that we can, with it, see all around this world, but we cannot see anything which is fifty miles away. Fifty miles away is too close, just the same as when I brought this a few inches from your eye box. You could not see it. I will show you Kalimpong. With that, he turned aside and did something to some knobs which were upon the wall. The lights in the room dimmed. They were not extinguished, but they dimmed so that the light was akin to that which follows immediately the setting of the sun beyond the Himalayas. A cool dimness, where the moon has not yet risen and where the sun has not yet withdrawn all its light. He turned to the back of the big box, and his hands moved over something that I could not see. Immediately lights glowed in the box. Quite slowly scenery formed. 
the high peaks of the Himalayas, and upon a trail a caravan of traders. They crossed a little wooden bridge, beneath which a rushing torrent threatened to engulf them should they but slip. They reached the other side, and they followed a trail through rough pasture land. For some minutes we watched them, and the view was that which a bird would obtain. A view as though one of the gods of the sky were holding the eye-box and gently floating across the still barren terrain. My captor moved his hands again, and there was an absolute blur of motion. Something came into sight and went by. Captain moved his hands in the opposite direction. Picture steady. But no, it was not a picture. It was the actual thing. This was not a picture. This was reality. This was truth. This was looking down through a hole in the sky. Below I saw the houses of Kalimpong. I saw the streets thronged with traders. I saw lamaseries with yellow-robed lamas and red-robed monks wandering about. It was all very strange. I had some difficulty in locating places because I had been to Kalimpong only once, and that was when I was a young boy, and I had seen Kalimpong from foot level from the level of a small boy standing. Now I was seeing it, well, I suppose I was seeing it from the air, as the birds see it. My captor was watching me intently. He moved certain things, and the image or landscape, or whatever one is to call such a marvelous thing, blurred into speed and steadied again. Here, said the man, is the Ganges, which, as you know, is the sacred river of India. I knew a lot about the Ganges. Sometimes traders from India would bring magazines with pictures in them. We could not read a single word of writing in those magazines, but the pictures, ah, that was different. Here before me, unmistakably, was the actual river Ganges. Then, to my quite stupefied surprise, it dawned on me that I was hearing, as well as seeing. I could hear the Hindus chanting. And then I saw why. They had a body laid out on a terrace by the water's edge, and they were sprinkling the body with the holy water of the river Ganges before conveying it to the burning gods. The river was crowded, and it seemed absolutely amazing that there could be so many people in the world, let alone in a river. Females were disrobing in a most shameless manner on the banks, but so were the men. I felt myself going hot all over at such a display. But then I thought of the temples, the terrace temples, the grottoes, and the colonnades, and I looked, and I was amazed. This was reality indeed, and I began to be confused. My captor, for I must still remember, he was my captor. My captor then moved something, and there was a blur of motion. He peered into that window intently. And then the blurring stopped with quite a jerk. Berlin, he said. Well, Berlin, I knew Berlin was a city somewhere in the Western world, but all this was so strange that really it didn't convey much to me. I looked down and thought that perhaps it was the novel viewpoint which was distorting everything. Here there were tall buildings, remarkably uniform in size and shape. I have never seen so much glass in my life. There were glass windows everywhere. And then on what seemed to be a very hard roadway, there were two metal rods set into the road itself. They were shiny, and they were absolutely uniform in their distance apart. I just could not understand it. Around a corner into my range of vision walked two horses, one behind the other. And I hardly expect you to believe this, but they were drawing what appeared to be a metal box on wheels. The horses walked between the metal bars, and the wheels of the metal box actually rode along those bars. The box had windows, windows all the way around, and peering in I could see people, people inside the box, people being drawn along, right in front of my sight. I almost said, right in front of my eyes, so accustomed was I now to this sight box. The device drew to a halt. People got out of the box, and others got in. A man went to the front, in front of the first horse, and poked about in the ground with another rod. Then he got back into the metal box and drove off. 
and the box then turned to the left off the main set of rods onto another. I was so amazed at this that I couldn't look at anything else. I had no time for anything else. Just this strange metal box on wheels carrying people. But then I looked at the sides of the road where there were people. Men were there in remarkably tight clothing. They had garments on their legs which seemed very, very narrow, and outlined the exact contours of the legs. And on the head of each man there appeared the most remarkable bowl-shaped thing, upside down and with a narrow rim around it. It caused me some amusement because they did look peculiar. But then I looked at the females. I had never seen anything like it. Some of these females were almost uncovered at the top of their body, but the lower part of the body was absolutely wrapped in what seemed to be a black tent. They seemed to have no legs. One could not even see their feet. With one hand they clutched the side of this black tent thing, apparently in an effort to keep the bottom from dragging in the dust. I looked some more. I looked at the buildings, and some of those buildings were truly noble edifices. Down the street, a very wide street came a body of men. They had music coming from the first lot of men. There was much shiny, and I wondered if it was gold and silver instruments they had. But as they came nearer, I saw that the instruments were of brass, and some were just metal. These were all big men with red faces, and they were all dressed in some martial uniform. I burst out laughing at the strutting way in which they were walking. They were bringing their knees right up so the upper limb was quite horizontal. My captor smiled at me and said, Yes, it is a very strange march indeed, but that is the German goose-step, which the German army use on ceremonial occasions. My captor moved his hands again. Once more there was this blurring. Once more the things behind the window of the box dissolved into foaming mist, then stopped, then solidified. Russia, said my captor, the land of Tsars, Moscow. I looked, and snow was upon the land. Here, too, they had strange vehicles, vehicles such as I had never imagined. There was a horse harnessed to what appeared to be a large platform fitted with seats. That large platform was raised several inches from the ground by things which looked like flat metal strips. The horse drew this contraption along, and as it moved it left depressions in the snow. Everyone was wearing fur, and their breath was coming like frozen steam from their mouths and nostrils. They looked quite blue with the cold. But I looked about at some of the buildings, thinking how different they were from the ones I had seen before. They were strange. They were great walls standing up, and beyond the walls rooftops were bulbous, almost like onions upside down, and their roots projecting up into the sky. The palace of the Tsar, said my captor. A glint of water caught my sight, and I thought of our own happy river which I had not seen for so long. That is the Moscow River, said my captor. It is a very important river indeed. Upon it there rode strange vessels made of wood and with great sails hanging from poles. There was little wind about, so the sails were hanging flaccid, and men had other poles with flattened ends which they moved so that the flat ends dipped in the river, and so propelled the craft. But all this, well, I did not see the point of it, so I said to the men, Sir, I have seen undoubted marvels. No doubt it would interest many. But what is the point of it? What are you trying to prove to me? A sudden thought occurred to me. Something had been nagging at the back of my mind for the last several hours, something which now leaped into my consciousness with insistent clarity. Sir, Captain, I exclaimed, who are you? Are you God? He looked at me rather pensively, as if he were nonplussed by what was obviously an unexpected question. He fingered his chin, ruffled his hair, and shrugged his shoulders slightly. Then he replied, you would not understand. There are some things which cannot be comprehended unless one has reached a certain stage. Let me answer you by asking you a question. 
If you were in a lamasery and one of your duties was to look after a herd of yaks, would you answer a yak who asked you what you were? I thought about it, and then I said, Well, sir, certainly I should not expect a yak to ask me such a question. But if he did ask me such a question, I should regard it as proof that he was an intelligent yak, and I should go to some trouble to try to explain to him what I was. You ask me, sir, what I would do about a yak who asked me a question, and I reply to you that I would answer that yak to the best of my ability. In the conditions which you mention, I would say that I was a monk, and that I had been appointed to look after those yaks, and that I was doing my best for those yaks, and I regarded them as my brothers and my sisters, although we were different forms. I would explain to the yak that we monks believed in reincarnation. I would explain that we each came down to this earth to do our appointed tasks, and to learn our appointed lessons, so that in the heavenly fields we could prepare to journey on to even higher things. Well spoken, monk, well spoken, said my captor. I regret exceedingly that it takes one of the lower orders to give me a sense of perspective. Yes, you are right. You have amazed me greatly, monk, by the perception you have shown, and I must say by your intransigence, because you have been rather firmer than I should be if I should be so unfortunate as to be placed in comparable circumstances. I felt bold now, so I said, You refer to me as one of the lower orders. Before that you referred to me as a savage, uncivilized, uncultured, knowing nothing. You laughed at me when I admitted the truth that I knew nothing of great cities in this world. But, sir, I told you the truth. I told you the truth. I admitted my ignorance. But I am seeking to lighten that ignorance, and you are not helping me. I ask you again, sir. You have made me captive entirely against my will. You have engaged in great liberties with my body, the temple of my soul. You have indulged in some most remarkable events, apparently designed to impress me. I might be more impressed, sir, if you answered my question. Because I know what I want to know, I ask you again, who are you? For some time he just stood there looking embarrassed. And then he said, In your terminology there are no words, no concepts, which would enable me to explain the position. Before a subject can be discussed, the first requisite is that both sides, both parties, shall understand the same terms, shall be able to agree on certain precepts. For the moment, let me just tell you that I am one who can be likened to the medical lamas of Chakpori. I am charged with the responsibility of looking after your physical body and preparing you so that you can be filled with knowledge when I am satisfied that you are ready to receive that knowledge. Until you are filled with this knowledge, then any discussion on who I am or what I am would be pointless. Just accept for the moment that what we are doing is for the good of others and that although you may be highly incensed at what you consider to be liberties we are taking with you, yet after, when you know our purpose, when you know what we are, and you know what you and your people are, you will change your opinion. With that, he switched off my sight, and I heard him leave the room. I was again in the dark night of blindness, and again alone with my thoughts. The dark night of blindness is a dark night indeed. When I had been blinded, when my eyes had been gouged out, gouged out by the filthy fingers of the Chinese, I had known agony, and even with my eyes removed I had seen, or seemed to see, bright flashes, swirling lights without shapes or form, that had subsided throughout subsequent days. But now I had been told that a device had been tapped into my optic nerve, and I could indeed believe it. I had every reason to believe it. My captor had switched off my sight, but an after-memory of it remained. Again I was experiencing that peculiar, contradictory sensation of numbness and tingling in the head. It might seem absurd to talk of feeling numb and tingling at the same time. But that is how I felt, 
and I was left with my numb tingling and all the swirling lights. For a time I lay there, considering all that had happened to me. The thought occurred to me that perhaps I was dead, or mad, and all these things were but the figment of my mind, leaving the conscious world. My training as a priest came to my rescue. I used age-old discipline to reorient my thoughts. I stopped reason and so permitted my over-self to take over. No imagination this. This was the real thing. I was being used by higher powers for higher purposes. My fright and panic subsided. Composure returned to me, and for some time I ticked over in my mind in rhythm to the beating of my heart. Could I have behaved differently? I wondered. Had I exercised all caution in my approach to new concepts? Would the great thirteenth have acted otherwise if he had been in a similar position? My conscience was clear. My duty was plain. I must continue to act as a good Tibetan priest, and all would be well. Peace suffused me. A feeling of well-being enveloped me like a warm yak wool blanket protecting against the cold. Somehow, sometime, I drifted off into a dreamless, untroubled sleep. The world was shifting. Everything seemed to be rising and falling. A strong sensation of motion and then a metallic clang woke me abruptly from my slumber. I was moving. My table was moving. There came the musical chink and tinkle of all the glassware being moved as well. As I remembered, all these things had been attached to the table. Now everything was on the move. Voices surrounded me, high voices, low voices, discussing me, I feared. But what strange voices, so different from anything I had known. There was movement on my table, but silent movement. No sliding, no grating, merely a floating. This, I thought, must be how a feather feels when it is blown upon the wind. Then the table motion changed direction. Obviously I was being guided down a corridor. Soon we entered what was clearly a large hall. The echoes gave a resonance of distance, considerable distance. A final, rather sickening, swaying sweep, and my table clanged down upon what my experience told me was a rock floor. But how could this be? How could I suddenly be in what my senses told me was a cave? My curiosity was soon set at rest, or was it wedded? I have never been sure. There was a continual babble of talk, all in a language quite unknown to me. With the clanging of my metal table upon the rock floor, a hand touched my shoulder, and the voice of my captor said, Now we will give you sight. You should be sufficiently rested by now. There was a scraping and a click. Colors whirled around me. Lights flashed, grew dim, and settled down to a pattern. Not a pattern that I understood. Not a pattern that conveyed anything to me. I lay there wondering what it was all about. There was an expectant silence. I could feel people looking at me. Then a short, sharp, barked question. My captor's footsteps coming swiftly towards me. Can you not see? he asked. I see a curious pattern, I replied. I see that which has no meaning for me, a pattern of wavy lines, of swaying colors, and flashing lights. That is all I see. He muttered something and hurried away. There was a muted talk in the sound of metallic objects being touched together. Lights flickered and colors flared. Everything whirled in a mad ecstasy of alien patterns steadied, and I saw. There was a vast cavern some two hundred or more feet high. Its length and breadth were beyond my computation, for they faded into dim darkness far beyond my range of vision. The place was huge, and it contained what I could only liken to an amphitheater, the seats of which were filled by what shall I call them? Creatures which could only have come from a catalogue of gods and devils. 
yet strange as these things were. And even stranger object hung poised in the center of the arena. A globe which I perceived to be the world hung before me, slowly rotating while from afar a light shone upon it, as the light from the sun shone upon this earth. There was now a hushed silence. The strange creatures stared at me. I stared back at them, although I felt small and wholly insignificant before this mighty throng. Here were small men and women, seemingly perfect in every detail and of godlike mien, radiating an aura of purity and calm. Others there were also, were manlike, but with a curious, quite incredible bird head, complete with scales or feathers. I could not at all distinguish which, and with hands which, although human in shape, still had astounding scales and claws. Also there were giants, immense creatures who loomed like statues and overshadowed their own diminutive companions. These were undeniably human, yet of such size as to overwhelm one's comprehension, men and women, or male and female, and others who could have been either or neither. They sat and stared at me until I grew uncomfortable under their steady gaze. To one side sat a godlike creature, stern-visaged and erect. In gorgeous living colors he sat calmly regal, like a god in his heaven. Then he spoke again in an unknown tongue. My captor hurried forward and bent over me. I shall put these things in your ears, he said and then you will understand every word which is said here. Do not be afraid. He grasped the upper edge of my right ear and pulled it upwards with one hand. With the other he inserted some small device into the ear orifice. Then he leaned over further and did the same to my left ear. He twisted a small knob attached to a box beside my neck and I heard sound. It dawned on me that I could understand the strange tongue which formerly had been incomprehensible. There was no time to wonder at this marvel. I had perforce to listen to the voices around me, voices which I now understood. Voices which I now understood, a language which I now understood. Yes, but the grandeur of the concepts was far above my limited imagination. I was a poor priest from what had been described as the terrain of savages, and my comprehension was not sufficient to enable me to perceive the meaning of that which I now heard and had thought to be intelligible. My captor observed that I was having difficulties and hastened again towards me. What is it? he whispered. I am too ill-educated to understand the meanings of any except the simpler words, I whispered back. The things which I heard have no meaning at all for me. I cannot comprehend such lofty thoughts. With a very worried expression on his face, he hesitantly walked to a large official, clad in gorgeous clothes, who stood near the throne of the Great One. There was a whispered conversation, then the two walked slowly toward me. I tried to follow the talk going on about me, but succeeded not at all. My captor leaned over me and whispered, Explain to the adjutant your difficulty. Adjutant, I said to him. I do not even know what the word means. Never before had I felt so inadequate, so ignorant, so utterly frustrated. Never before had I felt so out of my depth. The adjutant person smiled down at me and said, Do you understand what I am saying to you? I do indeed, sir, was my reply, but I am utterly ignorant of the whole matter of the Great One's talk. I cannot comprehend the subject. The concepts are beyond me. He nodded his head and replied, Our automatic translator obviously is to blame. It is not fitted to your metabolism nor to your brain pattern. No matter, the Surgeon General, whom we believe you refer to as your captor, We'll deal with the matter and we'll prepare you for the next session. This is a trifling delay and I will explain it to the Admiral. He nodded amiably to me and strode off to the Great One. Admiral? 
What was an admiral, I wondered? What was an adjutant? The terms had no meaning at all for me. I composed myself to await developments. The one referred to as the adjutant reached the great one and spoke quietly to him. It all appeared very unhurried and very tranquil. The great one nodded his head, and the adjutant beckoned to the one who was called Surgeon General, or my captor. He went forward, and there was an animated discussion. At last my captor put his right hand to his head in the strange gesture which I had noticed, turned towards me, and walked briskly to me at the same time making motions apparently to someone beyond my range of vision. The talk continued. There had been no interruption. A large man was on his feet, and I had the impression that he was discussing something about food supplies. A strange female jumped to her feet and made some sort of answer. It appeared to be a strong protest at something which the man had sent. Then, with face red with anger, she sat down abruptly. The man continued, unperturbed. My captor reached me and muttered, You have disgraced me. I said you were an ignorant savage. Crossly, he wrenched things from my ears. With a quick sweep of his hand, he did something which instantly deprived me of sight again. There was the rising sensation, and I felt my table moving away from that huge cave. Not at all carefully, my table and equipment was pushed along a corridor. There came metallic squeaks and clangs, and a sudden change of direction, and an unpleasant feeling of falling. With quite a bang, my table hit the floor, and I guessed that I was again in the metal room from whence I came. Curt voices, the rustle of cloth, and the shuffle of feet, the slither of the sliding metal door, and I was left alone again with my thoughts. What was it all about? Who was the admiral? What was the adjutant? And why was my captor called Surgeon General? What was this place? The whole thing was far, far beyond me. I lay there with burning cheeks, feeling hot all over. I was mortified almost beyond endurance that I had comprehended so very, very little. Quite definitely I had acted like an ignorant savage. They must have thought as I would have thought if I had regarded a yak as a sentient person and had so addressed him, but without result. Perspiration broke out all over me as I contemplated how I had brought shame to my priestly caste by my sheer inability to understand. I felt terrible. There I lay, enmeshed in my misery, prey to the darkest and most ignoble thoughts, full of the deep suspicion that we all were savages to these unknown people. I lay there and sweated. The door screeched open, and giggling and chattering uproar filled the room. Those unmentionable females again. With great elan, they ripped off my single sheet once again, leaving me as naked as a newborn baby. Without ceremony, I was rolled on to my side. A cold sheet of something clammy was slid under my length, and violently I was rolled back to the other side. There was a sharp yank as the edge of the sheet was pulled further under me. For a moment I feared that I would be precipitated off the table. Female hands grasped me and urgently scoured me with sharp, stinging solutions. Roughly I was rubbed dry with what felt to be old sacking. The most intimate portions of my body were prodded and poked, and strange implements were introduced. Time dragged on. I was goaded almost beyond endurance, but there was naught that I could do. Most thoroughly had I been immobilized against such a contingency. But then began such an assault upon me that at first I feared I was being tortured. Females gripped my arms and legs and twisted them and bent them at all angles. Hard hands dug into the muscles of my body and kneaded me as though I were but a mass of dough. Knuckles made depressions in my organs and I was left gasping for air. My legs were wrenched far apart, and the unceasingly chattering females drew long woolen sleeves over my feet, up my legs, and near onto my thighs. I was lifted by the back of my neck so that I was bent forward from the waist, 
Some form of garment was thrust around my upper body and appeared to be tied over my chest and abdomen. A strange, evil-smelling foam impinged upon my scalp, and instantly a rattling buzz sounded. The source of the buzz touched me and made even my teeth rattle. The few I had remaining after the Chinese had knocked most of them out. There was a shearing sensation that reminded me of yaks being shorn of their wool. A rough wipe, so rough that I felt the skin must surely peel, and another form of mist landed upon my defenseless head. The door slithered again, and there came the sound of male voices. One I recognized, that of my captor. He came to me, and using my own language said, We are going to expose your brain. There is nothing to worry about. We are going to put electrodes right into your... The words had no meaning for me except to indicate that I was in for another bad time and that I could do nothing at all about it. Strange odors pervaded the air. The chattering females fell silent. All talk ceased. Metal clanged against metal. There came the gurgle of fluids and I felt a sudden sharp prick in my upper left arm. Violently my nose was grasped and some strange tubular device was rammed up my nostrils and down my throat. Around my skull I felt the succession of sharp pricks which instantly gave way to numbness. There came a high-pitched whine and a most horrid machine touched my skull and crawled all around it. It was sawing off the top of my head. The terrible, grinding pulsation penetrated every atom of my being. I had the impression that every bone in my whole body was vibrating in protest. At last, as I could well feel, the whole top of my head was cut off with the exception of a small flap of flesh, which left my skull hinged at that point. By now I was in a state of terror, a strange form of terror, because although I was terrified, Yet I was determined that death itself would not make me murmur. Indescribable sensations now assailed me. Without any obvious reason, I suddenly uttered a long-drawn-out, Ah! Then my fingers began to violently twitch. A stinging in my nostrils made it imperative that I sneeze violently. But I could not sneeze. But worse was to follow. Suddenly there stood before me my maternal grandfather. He was clad in the dress of a government official. He was speaking to me with a kind smile on his face. I looked at him. Then the impact came to me. I did not look at him. I had no eyes. What magic was this? In my amazed exclamation during which the apparition of my grandfather vanished, my captor moved to my side. What is it? he queried. I told him. Oh, that's nothing, he exclaimed. We are merely stimulating certain centers of your brain that, that you may comprehend the more easily. We see that you have ability, but you have been sunk in the sloth and stupor of superstition, and will not permit yourself to open your mind. We are doing it for you. A female screwed the small ear devices into my ear orifices, and for her roughness she might well have been screwing tent pegs into hard soil. There was a click, and I could understand the outlandish language. I could comprehend it, too. Words like cortex, medulla oblongata, psychosomatic, and other terms were now clear to me in their meanings and implications. My basic intelligence quotient was being enhanced, and I knew what it all meant. But it was an ordeal. It was exhausting. Time seemed to stand still. People appeared to walk round endlessly. Their idle chatter was unceasing. The whole affair became entirely boring. I longed to be out and away, out from this place of strange odors, from this place where the top of my head had been cut off like the top of a hard-boiled egg. Not that I had ever seen a hard-boiled leg. That was for traders and those who had money, not for poor priests who lived on Sampa. From time to time, people would address remarks to me, questions, how was I, did I have pain, 
did I think I saw something? What color did I imagine I saw? My captor stood beside me a while and told me that various centers were being stimulated and that I should, during the course of the treatment, experience sensation which could frighten me. Frighten me? I had been frightened the whole time, I told him. He laughed at that and casually remarked that as a result of the treatment I was now having I should have to live as a solitary hermit for the whole of a long life because of the increased perceptions I should have. Never would anyone live with me, he said, until almost at the end of my life. A young man would come to take all the knowledge I had and to carry it on and eventually place it before an unbelieving world. At last, after what appeared to be an eternity, my bony skull cap was replaced. Strange metal clips were pushed in to join the two halves together. A strip of cloth was wound round and round my head and all departed save one female who sat beside me. From the rustle of paper it was evident that she was reading instead of paying attention to her duties. There came the soft plop of a book falling, and then rhythmic snores from the female. I decided that I too would sleep.